Hey, praise the Lord. Greetings to you once again in Jesus' name. It is I, Brother Clinton, and you are back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth as Jesus Christ commanded. If you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, please open up with me to Matthew chapter 7, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7, and I'd like to share with you verses 13 and 14. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a red letter Bible, then these words are written in red. He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. The straight gate. That's the narrow gate. Straight, S T R A I T, means difficult. Okay, difficult or narrow. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to talk to you right now for a few minutes about something that is called the return. And I'll explain that in a few minutes here. And, and in doing so, I want to make manifest the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in these two verses of the scripture, wherein he made manifest the difference between the broad path that leadeth unto destruction, and the narrow way that leadeth unto life. When I speak the things that I'm going to speak, I'm not speaking evil against any man. I want you to know that. Okay, This, this video and this ministry is not about slandering anybody. And so there's a particular man that I'm going to be talking about. His name is Jonathan Kahn. And he may, be, he may be a very nice man. I don't know him. I've never met him. And I'm not saying anything against him. I'm not going to speak any evil about him. But I'm going to make manifest in this video that he is not in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he, being the organizer and leader of a movement called The Return, is organizing something that is very dangerous. And those people that are involved in it or that shall be involved in it are going to be involved in something very dangerous and satanic that they don't really understand. And this is why Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. But narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You see? So, I have some pages open in front of me on the internet, and I will leave links below in the information box so that you can find these as well. The first link that I have open is the page uh, of a website called The Return. It's called thereturn.org. And uh, I have open in front of me the statement of faith. The return.org is a link that I got from a video, a YouTube video, which is titled Jonathan Kahn Prophetic Announcement, The Return, full version. Okay, and it's 8 minutes and 39 seconds long. And in the information box of that video is the address to this website that I have right in front of me. I watched the video of Jonathan Kahn speaking. And it seems to me that he's very adamant about what he believes. It seems to me that he's very sincere about what he believes. I don't believe that he's lying to anybody on purpose, although I could be wrong. But he nevertheless is deceiving people, and that's what I want to talk to you about. So the first link I'm going to leave for you is the Jonathan Kahn prophetic announcement, which I watched this video and there's no prophetic announcement in it at all. Um, and the second link that I'm going to provide for you is the website, which is actually linked on the YouTube video. Okay, so the statement of faith of Jonathan Kahn, he says, we believe. The statement of faith of Jonathan Kahn and whatever organization he is a part of or he is the head of. I want to talk to you about these things in the light of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. For in doing so, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy 4.16. And also in 2 John verse 9, it is written, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Period. Okay, Whosoever abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If any come unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Now Jonathan Kahn spoke in the video uh, that is linked below in the information box about what happened on that terrible day that we refer to as 9-11. We all know what 9-11 means. And he said that on that day, many, many people flocked into places of worship, houses of worship, and they sought God. 
that's an error okay that that didn't happen many people flocked into their denominational churches and they worshiped that which they know not of they weren't seeking god at all because the people that were seeking god were standing back saying god is the one who sent that and i know that it was orchestrated by wicked men and that which happened on 9-11 wasn't it didn't have anything to do with any hijackers and there were no passengers on the planes that crashed into the into the world trade center there was also no plane that crashed in shanksville pennsylvania and there was also no plane that crashed into the pentagon the whole thing was a hoax and a lie but at the same time there were a lot of people that lost their lives because of it and it was perpetrated by criminals within the various intelligence agencies of several different governments but at the same time that doesn't mean that it wasn't the hand of god who did it because god it was god who brought judgment upon the financial capital of the united socialist states of america because they worshiped money and so people a lot of people talked about all the innocent people that were in the towers the world trade center towers well guess what there weren't any innocent people in those towers and there weren't any christians in those towers how do i know that because i know that god will not judge the righteous with the wicked there were no christians in those towers the people that were in those towers were wicked ungodly people who had turned their backs on god and made money their god it was the world trade center that's what it was okay so there were no innocent people there and the people of america did not seek god after that happened they didn't seek god after that happened all they did was go to their their catholic and anglican and protestant churches and did their rituals that they always do they weren't seeking god if they were seeking god they wouldn't have gone to those churches because those churches have nothing to do with god and so he was incorrect about that and and he is organizing something called the return which is um which is a, a what he expects to be a huge congregation of people gathered together in a place a very specific place called the national mall if you have access to google maps do a google search for washington dc the national mall and you will see that the national mall is located right at the washington monument and, the, and they even have pictures. Jonathan Kahn has pictures on his website of the Washington Mount Monument, which is a satanic obelisk. It's a phallic symbol. It pertains to the fallen angels, and it's, it originated in Babylon and in Egypt, and they're all over the world, in every satanic uh, empire all over the world. And in, in Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, which is not the United States of America, it's not one of the 50 states, it has nothing to do with America, it's a foreign country. Okay, The United States of America with a small u and a small s is a country that has 50 states between mexico and canada the united states of america in all capital letters is a corporation that exists in a foreign country called the district of columbia the district of columbia washington dc is a foreign country to the united states of america it's not part of the united states of america it's on united states of america land or land that used to belong to the United States of America, right between Maryland and Virginia, okay, Catholic states. It's right between those two states. It's called the District of Columbia. It is a, it is a sovereign nation state which belongs to the Vatican, and it is the war arm of the Vatican. It's a completely foreign country from the United States. Okay. Washington, D.C. is not part of the United States of America, the country. It's a completely separate foreign country, a foreign government. Okay. It has nothing to do with the United States of America, except it, has, it houses a corporation that's called by a name that sounds the same but is spelled differently. That's a deception that many people are not aware of. And so this thing called the return is being organized to happen at the National Mall in Washington, D.C., which is at the south end of a huge pentagram right at the washington monument in front of the reflecting pool not only is the washington monument a huge satanic monument an obelisk but it's built right at the end of a reflecting pool and that's on purpose because it's it has to do with the satanic philosophy of as above so below if you don't know what that means you have access to google look that up and find out 
all about that as a, as above so below and you'll see it in all sorts of imagery all over the world because satan is the god of this world and you'll see his imagery all over the place so the location that jonathan khan has chosen for this thing called the return that is supposed to be that is being presented as seeking god for the rest pardon me for the restoration of america is happening right at the south end of an inverted pentagram, an upside down pentagram, if you look at it from the north to the south, the streets of Washington DC are in the shape of a pentagram. Okay, that's on purpose. It was made that way on purpose. Washington DC is a satanic uh, nation state that belongs to the Vatican. It's the war arm of the Vatican. The streets are in the form of a pentagram. Washington DC is the house of the Pentagon which is also a pentagram, which is the center of, of operations for the United States military, which is a satanic organization that belongs to the Vatican. This is why the U.S. military has a what people think is a star, which is actually a pentagram, for its logo. You see, the U.S. military belongs to Satan, and they work for a foreign country called the District of Columbia. That's why the U.S. military doesn't have anything to do with defending freedom uh, for Americans. If they did, they'd be on the streets of America right now defending them from the insurgents who are waging war all across America. Right now, I'm talking to you in July of 2020. It's July 7th, the year 2020. And America is under siege. And the news media is calling it protests. And the federal government is backing the insurgents and arresting people who defend themselves and their property against these insurgents. They're not protesters. They're insurgents. This is war. The United States is at war. It's being attacked by insurgents more and more and more. And so if the U.S. military was about the business of protecting the people of America and defending freedom, then they would be on the streets in the various cities in America uh, quelling this attack and defending the people of the United States of America. But they're not. They're in 180 countries all around the world defending the oil, drug, and counterfeiting cartels. That's what the U.S. military is for, because they are owned by the District of Columbia, which is a foreign country from the United States of America, it is a national, it, pardon me, it is a nation state, a sovereign, satanic nation state, which is owned and operated by the Vatican. The Vatican is a sovereign nation state as well, Vatican City, and also the city of London. I've spoken about this in other public videos before. So there are these three nation states in the world that have nothing to do with the countries in which they reside. Vatican City, the City of London, City of London Corporation specifically, and the District of Columbia. Okay, these are three sovereign nation states. The District of Columbia has nothing to do with the United States of America. It's not American. It's not one of the 50 states. It's a foreign country. And that's who owns and operates the U.S. military, which is a satanic organization of murdering thugs that are there for the purpose of defending the global elitists and their empires, their oil, drug, and counterfeiting empires. Okay, that's what they're there for. So, having said that, the, the Washington, D.C. was designed with the streets in the center of the city shaped in the form of a pentagram, an upside-down pentagram, which is, of course, on purpose because that is something that Satanists use to call up devils. And so, at the south end of that pentagram, there is a an obelisk, which is a satanic monument. It's a phallic symbol that relates to the phallus members of the of the fallen angels. And that's there when they're, you know, in, in heavenly places wandering around, they see that and they that marks their territory. An obelisk marks satanic territory. The fallen angels, when they're flying around, they know that that's their territory. That's their mark. Okay. And Jonathan Kahn is organizing this event on the 26th of September. And he has some pretty good reasons, some pretty good excuses why he's putting it on the 26th of September. Some things from, from history and some things from the Bible, and that's all very nice and everything. Um, and I don't know, maybe there's something else about the 26th of September that I don't know about, and I haven't done a whole lot of research about what has ever happened on the 26th of September, and it doesn't really matter uh, at this point, unless if, if one of you knows something about it, feel free to add that in the comment form here. But he is organizing this event on the 26th of September, right at the reflecting pool in front of the Washington Monument at the south end of the world's largest pentagram, Washington, D.C., the National Mall. This is 
a satanic sacrifice. This is a sacrifice to Baal. Okay? If all these people were Christians, if Jonathan Kahn and all these people were Christians, and they were doing this in honor of the United States of America, or in, in, in representation of the United States of America, number one, they wouldn't be gathering at the south end of a pentagram right in front of an obelisk. And number two, they wouldn't be in Washington, the District of Columbia, because that has nothing to do with America. So, having said that, okay, I wanted to get those things out of the way. I'm on this website called The Return, and I'm on the page that says uh, their statement of faith. If you go to The Return website, you just go to the, uh, the, the uh, links on the top, and one of them is About. A drop-down menu appears, and at the bottom it says Our Statement of Faith. So just click on that, you'll wind up right there. It says, We Believe. I want to talk to you about these things. We Believe. It says, we believe that the Bible, this is number one, we believe that the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, is the Word of God and is the final authority in faith and life, and the New Testament scriptures representing the final revelation and counsel of God and constitute the final counsel in all matters. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay? I think we can all be in agreement on that. Number two, he says, we believe in the one God of the scriptures of Israel and of all existence, eternal eternally existent in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alrighty, well, eternally existent in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is Babylonian mythology. It doesn't come from the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible that says anything like that. Uh, there's only one sentence in the Bible that contains the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that is in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, when Jesus was talking about his name. Um, he wasn't talking about any three persons that were eternally existent. He was talking about a name, one name, the name of Jesus Christ. He said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So there wasn't any persons and there. There's nobody that's eternally existent with each other. Okay, There is only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Godhead is. And so when he says this, eternally existent in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we who are Christians know that this man is not in the faith of Jesus Christ. Because even though he avoided using the word Trinity, and that was very clever on his part, still what he's speaking about is a Trinity because there is no God that is eternally existent in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Son of God is not eternal. The Son of God is not eternal. He is the first and with the last. You see? The Son of God is not eternal. The Son of God didn't exist until he was formed in his mother's womb, just like I didn't exist until I was formed in my mother's womb. The Son of God is the Son of God, as the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. The Bible doesn't say that he is a deity called the Son. All right? Now, that's a difference that is very distinct, and it's something that I'm going to refer to later on in this video, so I want you to remember that. When those of us who are Christians say the Son, S-O-N, we are referring to the Son of God. But when those who are Babylonians, Trinitarians, when they say the Son, S-O-N, they're not referring to the Son of God. They're referring to a God called the Son. And that's a very important difference, because there is no God called the Son. Okay, that God called the Son that, that the Babylonian Trinitarians use, and, and they refer to, isn't anybody. It's nobody. It doesn't exist. There is no God called the Son. There is only one God, the Father. That's what the Scripture says. To us there is but one God, the Father. That's the only God there is. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, proclaimed that when he was praying to his God and my God in the 17th chapter of John. He said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. You see? So Jesus, the Son of God, proclaimed that the God that he prayed to is the only true God. Period. End of story. So there is no other God. There is no God the Son. There is no God the Holy Spirit. And there is no God that is eternally existent in three persons. That doesn't exist. So the fact that Jonathan Kahn or whoever it was that in his behalf that wrote the statement of faith wrote this lets us know at this point 
that Jonathan Kahn is not in the faith of Jesus Christ, and the people that are with him in this endeavor are also not in the faith of Jesus Christ, because they don't know who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is not God the Son. When you take words, a phrase like the Son of God, and you turn it around backwards so it says God the Son, it means something totally different. And who is it that likes to take words and phrases out of the Bible and turn them around backwards? I think it might be that old serpent, the devil. Amen. So, um, there is no God the Son, and there is no God that is eternally existent in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That doesn't exist. It's Babylonian mythology. It is, uh, it is um, what's it called? It's, um, it's uh, Nimrod and his mother and wife, Semiramis, and their illeg illegitimate son, Tammuz. It's Nimrod, Semiramis, and, Hamu and Tammuz. That's what the Trinity is. That's where it came from. And the Roman Catholic Church took it and gave it names from the Bible and you know, sent it out into all of her Protestant daughters. And now most of the world believes that God is a trinity of persons, even though he's, that's, there's nothing in the scripture that says anything about that. So anyway, I'm going to digress from that. If you'd like to know more about that, if I've just shocked you and you'd like to know more about that, please ask me because I'll be happy to refer you to many, many videos on this channel that will cover this, this, this subject in, many, in much detail from whatever verse of scripture that you want to ask about. There's no such thing as a trinity anywhere in the Bible. There's not one word of the scripture that says anything about a triune God or three persons or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit or an eternal Son or you know a pre-existent Christ or any of that stuff. It's all theological nonsense, philosophy, Babylonian myth. Okay, so this is how we know right now that Jonathan Kahn isn't a Christian. Let's go on. Number three, he says, We believe in Messiah, the Son, the Word of God, by his atoning death and resurrection, the mediator between man and God, the Redeemer of Israel and all the peoples, and all peoples, Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, salvation. This sounds very good to those people who don't know the scriptures, who don't know Jesus Christ. But let's just go over this a little bit. He says, We believe in Messiah, okay the Son. Now remember, I told you a couple of minutes ago that we're going to be referring to this. When they say the Son, they're not talking about the Son of God. They're talking about a God called the Son. And that's totally different. Okay, There is no God called the Son. So he says, in Messiah, the Son, the Word of God. Now, there are many people that believe that there is a God called the Son. And those people that believe that there is a God called the Son, they believe that this God is another God apart from God the Father, and that he is co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent with God the Father, and that this other God called the Son is the Word of God. That's what these people believe, because of Babylonian mythology and Roman lies. Okay, But the Bible doesn't say that the Word of God is a God called the Son. The Bible says that the Word of God was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, the Word of God is God himself. It doesn't say the Word was a God, like the Jehovah's Witness Bible says. That's what Trinitarians believe. They believe that the Word was a God. A God, apart from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only true God. They believe that there's another God called the Son, and they believe that this God called the Son is the Word. And that's a, a very grave error and a deadly error. Because the Bible doesn't say that the Word was Christ. It doesn't say that the Word was Jesus. It doesn't say that the Word was the Son. Or even that the Word was the Son of God. It says the Word was God. Now it's just four little words. The Word was God. It's a perfectly simple statement. It's not a parable. It's not an allegory. It says what it means. The Word was God. When you see the word God, capital G-O-D, in the Bible, in any instance, there's only one entity, one person, that that word is referring to. And it is the Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Maker of heaven and earth. There's no other use for that word in the entire Bible. 
when it's used with when it's written with a capital G, it can only be referring to one person, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But Rome has hypnotized people into thinking that that same word God, only in John chapter 1 verse 1, refers to a different God that doesn't exist, a God that they call the Son. And they believe that this other God called the Son is the one that came in the flesh. And so that's why they believe that God became a man. That's why they believe that God died on a cross. God didn't die on a cross. That's a ridiculous myth. If you believe that God died on a cross, that's mythology, and that makes absolutely no sense, and it's not true at all. And that will be relevant as we go on. So they said, we, I'm at point number three. We believe in Messiah, the Son, the Word of God. So we've already seen in the, the error that's in this. Okay, By his atoning death and resurrection. Wait a second. They're not talking about the Son of God. They're talking about a God called the Son. And they believe that a God called the Son, a God called God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, died and rose again. Now that's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? How is a God going to die and be raised again? A man can die and be raised again, and that's what happened. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, laid down his life and took it up again. As it is written, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Who was it that gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time? Was it God? Or was it the Son of God, the mediator between God and men, as the scripture says? You see, God didn't lay down his life on a cross. God, God wasn't killed. You can't kill God. Even the Romans can't kill God. Nobody can kill God. God cannot die. God is a spirit. The Son of God is a man. Okay, He's not a God-man. He's not fully God and fully man. He's a man. And in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When he was baptized in the Jordan River, the Bible says that God spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And then God filled his Son with his Spirit. God anointed his Son with his Spirit. The Holy Ghost is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost is in the Son of God. God was in Christ. God was manifest in the flesh. God did not die on a cross. And God was not risen from the dead. He couldn't have been risen from the dead because he's never died. But the Son of God did die. And he was risen from the dead. See, that's the difference. Not a God called the Son, the Son of God. So this point number three is just full of lies. But it's worded in such a way that it's very tricky and causes people that believe lies to think that it's true. So, And, he, and he's very careful not to, to use the word Trinity. And in that I commend him. But it's obvious that this is what he's talking about. In Messiah, the Son, the Word of God, by his atoning death and resurrection, the mediator between man and God, the Redeemer of Israel and all peoples, Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, salvation. So we can see by this, by the, these first three points, well, at least points number two and three, that whoever wrote this believes that God is a trinity of persons. They believe that the Son of God isn't really the Son of God, but that he's actually a God called the Son and that this God called the Son is actually the Word of God, instead of what the Bible says, that the Word was God. Okay, They believe that the Word was a God. A God, just like the Jehovah's Witness believe. Okay, And they believe that this other God, called the Son, gave us his atoning death and resurrection, and is the mediator between God and men. That's the deception. Let's go on. Point number four. We believe in the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in the fellowship and lives of all true believers. All right. I don't think they do. Because all true believers, to him, whoever wrote this, refers to people that believe the lies that he's writing in this statement of faith. And they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go on. Point five. We believe that in choosing to turn away from God, man has fallen into a state of sinfulness and guilt from which he needs to be saved and from which he is unable to save himself. 
Well, that's verily true. Amen. I'll, I'll applaud him on that one. That's that's true. I don't mean to be sarcastic at all. That's that's true. Point number six, that the one and only hope, we believe that the one and only hope, answer, and salvation for all has been given in the death and resurrection of Messiah in which we have been given forgiveness, peace, and everlasting life. Well, okay, if a Christian were saying that, that would be true when he, use, when he uses the, the, the word we, the personal pronoun we, okay? But when he uses the personal pronoun we, in, referring to himself and the people that were with him, that's a deception because they haven't been given forgiveness, peace, and everlasting life because they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and they haven't obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Point number seven. We believe that there is one way of salvation given to man in the atonement of God in Messiah that this is a free gift apart from works, not attained by any good work, and yet which leads to good works, a free gift given to all who will truly accept, believe, and receive it, turning completely to Jesus, Yeshua, trusting him with their lives in all things, and personally receiving him into their hearts. All right, this is peppered with deception. The reason I am going to say what I'm about to say is because of another video, which I'm going to link for you also in the information box below. It's a YouTube video that you can watch of Jonathan Kahn preaching what he believes to be the way of salvation. And I didn't watch the whole video. It's 22 minutes long, but I watched enough of it to know what he teaches about salvation. And during the course of this video, he said to the audience that if they will repeat this prayer prayer of salvation, as he called it, that he is going to to say to them, if he will say it slowly and they will repeat it and mean it in their hearts, that they will be saved. Before he did this, he quoted Romans 10.9 as, Roman 10, as if Romans 10.9 had anything to do with anyone becoming a Christian, which it certainly does not. And if you don't understand why I say that, please ask me and I'll be happy to refer you to a video on this channel that is called Romans 10.9. And it will explain to you what Romans 10.9 is and what it is not. But briefly, what it is, it is a part of a sentence in the middle of a teaching where Paul, the Apostle of Christ, was teaching Christians the difference between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith. What it is not is Paul, the Apostle of Christ, teaching anybody how to get saved from their sins and become a Christian. That's what it is not. And the world has been hypnotized into thinking that Romans 10.9 is the way of salvation for sinners. Why? Because they go to church, they open their Bible when the pastor begins a sermon, and they see that the verse that the pastor is quoting is there in their Bibles, and so then they close their Bibles and listen to the pastor tell a story. And they haven't searched the scriptures. They've never even read the whole Bible. And so they don't know that their pastor is lying to them. It just sounds good to them, and they don't want to seek God. They just want to go to church and pretend that you know God is pleased with them going to church. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as going to church. The Bible doesn't say that we should go to church. There's nothing in the Old Testament or the New Testament that has anything to do with going to church. Going to church has nothing to do with being a Christian or serving God. Absolutely nothing. There's no mention of it anywhere in the Scripture. The disciples of the Lord in the New Testament didn't go to church. There's no such thing. So, having said that, I know that Jonathan Kahn preaches a false gospel. And Paul the Apostle wrote, If we or an angel from heaven preach unto, you any, preach unto you any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So, anybody that tells you that there is such thing as a prayer of salvation, and that if you repeat these words and believe it in your heart, that, and accept Jesus Christ into your heart, that you'll be saved from your sins, and that the blood of Jesus Christ has forgiven you of your sins, and you have the Holy Spirit, um, that, that person has lied to you. And if that person has lied to you and you believed it, it's because you've never searched the Scriptures and you don't know what the Bible says about the way of salvation in the New Testament. <coughs> because the way of salvation in the New Testament is the doctrine that Jesus Christ gave to his holy apostles to begin preaching that the day that the New Testament began, on the day of Pentecost. 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's when the New Testament began. And when the New Testament began, the apostles of Jesus Christ began to preach, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, 
They were filled with power, and they spoke with other tongues and prophesied. And then they went everywhere preaching the gospel and baptizing people in the name of the Lord. That's what Christians do. They don't, Christians don't go to church. We go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And we teach people to do everything that the Lord our God commanded. That's what the church does. So praise the Lord. Let's go over point number seven again. It says, We believe that there is one way of salvation given to man in the atonement of God in Messiah, that this is a free gift apart from works, not attained by any good work, and yet which leads to good works, a free gift given to all. Okay, right there right there at that point, although this is kind of wordy, and I, I think I can see why he's wording it this way, to appease certain types of people from different denominations, although I'm not going to really get into that. Up to that point, Point number seven is true, okay? But now he di diverts from the truth, and he says, a free gift given to all who will truly accept, believe, and receive it. Now, where does the Bible say that we will be saved if we accept, believe, and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ? It doesn't say that. It says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Remission of sins, that's the pardon of your sins, the forgiveness of your sins. That's how the blood that Jesus, our Messiah, shed for us on the cross is applied to our lives and washes us from our sins. Even as Ananias was sent to Paul and he said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how our sins are washed away, when we call on the name of the Lord in baptism, being baptized under water, calling on the name of Jesus Christ. That's how the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for the remission of our sins, is applied to our lives to give us remission of our sins. That's the way. That's the only way. There is no other way. So he says, All who will truly accept, believe, and receive it, turning completely to Jesus, Yeshua, trusting him with all their lives and all things, and personally receiving him into their hearts. Okay. This is a Jesuit doctrine that was injected into the Protestant denominations a little over 150 years ago. Before that, nobody ever heard of any such foolishness, and there is no thing as as there is no such thing as personally receiving Christ into your heart. There's no such thing as that. There, there's nothing in the Bible that says anything like that. Personally receiving Him into your heart. Okay, that's a vain tradition of men. It's a lie, and it's given to you to divert you away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we began, when I, was, when I began speaking in this video in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, this makes manifest the difference between the broad path that leads to destruction and the narrow way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Why? Why are there few that find it? Because you have to actually read your Bible and do what it says in order to find it. And most people don't want to do that. Most people just want to go to church and pay for a religious entertainer to tell them about, you know, some, some nonsensical theological fables and then, you know, tell them that all is well between them and God. And then they pay for that entertainment and go home. And they think that God is pleased with them because they've been to church. And then they just live like the devil all week long and go back to church next week. What does that have to do with being a Christian or serving God? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. So there is no such thing as personally receiving Christ into your heart. There's no such thing as that. It's a doctrine that doesn't exist anywhere in the scripture. The apostles of Jesus Christ never heard of anything like that. And so consequently, they never told anybody to do that. There's no instance in the scripture where any apostle of Jesus Christ ever told anybody to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, to accept Christ in their heart, to make a decision for Christ, to say a salvation prayer or a sinner's prayer. There, there's no such thing. But yet people go to church and they carry their Bibles under their arms, Bibles that they've never read, and they applaud the man in the pulpit who is lying to them, and they say, Amen, Amen, Pastor, and they'll even argue against the gospel of Christ when those of us who are Christians come to them and tell them what the Bible says. And they'll, and they'll say, Oh, no, 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 the, Bible's, the, no, the Bible doesn't say that baptism saves you. Well, wait a second. Yes, it does. <laughs> Actually, Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the center of that which is this was that that which this is all about, said, "Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved." 
and he that believeth not shall be damned. That's what Jesus said. But religious people say that baptism doesn't save you. Well, Jesus said that it does. The apostles said that it does. God, the, the apostle Paul said that God saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. What's the washing of regeneration? Well, it's when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and regenerated. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The Bible says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's what baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is for. It's for the remission of sins, so that your sins can be washed away by the blood of Christ. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How many times do you need? I mean, the Bible says it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And over and over and over. But there are so many who are trained in their churches by their lying theologian pastors to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reject what the Bible says. And when Christians come to them and, and witness to them, they say, oh, no, no, my pastor preaches straight out of the Bible and baptism doesn't save us. It's just an outward showing of an inward change. Really, where does the Bible say that baptism is an outward showing of an inward change? Well, it might not say that in those words, but it is. It's just a, it's just a public profession of our faith. It is. Where does the Bible say that baptism is a public profession of our faith? Well, it, it might not say that in those, in those exact words, but that's what it means. Because that's what my pastor says. And he graduated from seminary. He speaks Hebrew and Greek. Really? Well, that's very nice and everything. But the Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. It doesn't say that if any man speak, let him speak in Greek and Hebrew. It says, let him speak as the oracles of God. So if you don't believe the word of God, then I can't preach the gospel of Christ to you. So let's go on with Jonathan Kahn's statement of faith. We finished with uh, number seven. Let's go on to uh, number eight, point number eight. We believe that true salvation brings a new birth, a new heart, cleansing, renewing, freedom, the indwelling of God's spirit, and the power of repentance to turn from sin and to live a new life of love, joy, peace, faithfulness, holiness, and righteousness. Well, this is all very nice and everything, and it, and it, and it uses a lot of words that are from the Bible, um, and, it's, and it is, is reminiscent of a teaching that is very popular in the churches, but a teaching that doesn't come from the Bible. Okay? The Bible doesn't say that true salvation brings a new birth. The Bible says, if any man, uh, pardon me, the Bible says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, That's true salvation. When you're born of water and of the Spirit, then you can enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, Being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But before that, two verses before that, and I was quoting from John chapter 3, verse 5. So in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a new birth. Being born again. How does, it, how does a man get born again? How do you get born again? What can you do to be born again? Well, you can't do anything to be born again. You didn't do anything to get born the first time. You didn't, you didn't do anything to get conceived in your mother's womb. You weren't out in the middle of nowhere, non-existent, and, and, and said to yourself, I'm going to be conceived. I've decided to be conceived, and so I choose that woman and that man right there. I want to be conceived, so I'm just going to make myself be conceived in that woman's womb. That's ridiculous. You were conceived in your mother's womb because of a decision that was made by your father and your mother. You had nothing to do with it. You didn't decide to become conceived in your mother's womb. Neither can you decide to be born again. Because just as when a little baby is born again, pardon me, just, like, just as when a little baby is conceived in its mother's womb, that little baby comes from a seed. The seed comes from his father and enters into the womb of his mother. And in her womb, life comes forth. Okay, So it is that every living thing comes from a seed. Every natural living thing comes from a seed. And so it is that when those of us who are born again are born again, we come from a seed. And that seed is the word of God. See, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. 
And it says in the first in the first chapter of John that the people of God are born not of the flesh, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, nor of blood, but of God. You see, I didn't quote that exactly word for word, so let me go there. John chapter one. And um, verse 12 and 13, it says, well, let's, let's read 11 through 13. It says, He came unto his own, his own people, the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, First Peter one twenty three, being born of that incorruptible seed of the Word of God, born again. See, First Peter one twenty three. Let's read that. Praise the Lord. First Peter one twenty three. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So a person who is born again is born again by the Word of God. They're not born again because they said a prayer. They're born again by the Word of God. The Word of God came to that person and brought forth life in his being, and he began to be able to see the kingdom of God and not desire to live in sin anymore. He can see the kingdom of God. He wants to serve God now. He fears God. He understands sin and righteousness now. And he doesn't want to sin anymore. He wants to live righteously. So he's been born again. Okay? That isn't salvation. That's something that leads to salvation. When you're born again and you can see the kingdom of God, then you can hear the gospel of Christ and obey it and become a Christian and be saved from your sins. How do you obey the gospel of Christ? Well, you do what the apostles of Jesus Christ commanded us to do in order to be saved from our sins, in order to have remission of our sins. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will speak with other tongues and prophesy. That's how you know that you've received the Holy Ghost. So he says that true salvation brings a new birth. Well, that's backwards. It's just like taking the phrase the Son of God and turning it around so it says God the Son. It means something totally different. It's backwards. True salvation doesn't bring a new birth. But those who are born again are led to the salvation of God. Praise the Lord. Let's go to, to point number nine. We believe in a universal gathering. Universal, I highlighted that word with my speech because I want to I want to talk to you about that. We believe in the universal gathering, unity and fellowship of all who have received salvation, born of the Spirit and Messiah, Jesus Yeshua, and called to fulfill the Great Commission to spread the gospel to all peoples, Jew and Gentile, to all unreached peoples of the world. All right, this is a lie. This has to do with something that many false preachers for a, for about a century have been referring to as the Great Last Days Revival. Okay, the Great Last Days Revival is a deception. The Bible speaks about a great falling away in the last days. You see, and God pouring out a spirit of strong delusion upon the people. The Bible speaks about that. The Bible speaks about gross darkness covering the earth in the last days, which we're living in right now. But the Bible doesn't speak about any last days revival, any great last days revival. But that lie of the great last days revival is what this is based on. Number nine, in the universal gathering. What, what's the importance of that word universal? Where else have we heard that word universal? Well, Catholic? How many of you know that Catholic isn't a name? It's an adjective. The word Catholic isn't a name, it's an adjective. The Roman Catholic Church is called the Roman Catholic Church because it is the Roman religion. It's not Christianity, it's not the religion of Jesus Christ as it's written in the Bible, it's the religion of the Romans. It's paganism. See, that's why they have their Saturnalia festival to worship Saturn, and they renamed it the Christ Mass, and they put it on the winter solstice on December 25th. That's why they have their Ishtar festival, and they call it Easter a festival to celebrate Ishtar, the fertility goddess of the Romans. That's why they have, you know, Easter bunnies and Easter eggs, because it's, you know, the rabbit is a symbol of fertility, because rabbits breed like crazy. And so, you know, that's, that's why they, they do all the things that they do in the Roman church. The Roman emperor, 
who is the Pope, how many of you know that we're living in the Roman Empire still? The Roman Empire hasn't ceased to exist. It didn't fall. It just went undercover. The Roman Empire is still very much alive and ruling this world. Okay, Just like the scripture says, let's just come with me to Revelation chapter uh, 18 real quick, or 17, I believe. Revelation chapter 17, in the last verse of the chapter. Praise the Lord. This Bible has a, lot, has a concordance in the back, so it makes it difficult to get to the last page sometimes. But uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. John saw a woman, a harlot, seated upon a beast, riding upon a beast. The woman is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. What is the great city that reigns over the kings of the earth? Well, it's that same city that was reigning over the kings of the earth in A.D. 90 when John was given that revelation. And it's the same that, that is reigning over all the earth today. It is Rome, Vatican City, like I was talking to you about a little while ago. Vatican City. That is where the king of the earth sits. He's the Roman emperor. And he's also called the Pope. He's called the Pope because the Roman Catholic Church is the religious front that he uses to perpetrate his crimes and to hide the fact that he is the emperor of the world. But he is the emperor of the world. I mean, just look at the way he lives, okay? He lives in a palace surrounded by guards. He lives in a city that is his own sovereign nation state. The Vatican City is not subject to any laws or statutes of any country except itself. Okay? Does the Pope pay taxes? <laughs> of course not. Is the Pope subject to the laws of the land? Can he be arrested for violating children and killing children and murdering people and starting wars and, and starting financial collapses and things like that? Can he be arrested for those things? No, he can't. Because he's not subject to, to the legal system of this world. The legal system is only for the subjects. It's only for the, the slaves, the plebes, the peasantry. It's not for the emperor. That's why he's not in prison. Because he is all those things that I mentioned and more. And he's certainly not a Christian. And when he's off camera, he laughs at how stupid people are who think that he's really a Christian. And so the universal church, the, the Roman Catholic Church, is called the Roman Catholic Church because it's the religion of Rome. It's the Roman religion. It's paganism. That's why the Pope wears a Dagon hat. okay? Because he worships the devil on purpose. He knows that he worships the devil. This is why he pours out the blood of children on the on the altar of Baal. Okay? That's not funny. He does that. And so the the Roman Catholic Church is the Roman religion, and it is Catholic, which means that it is universal, which means that it is imposed upon everybody. We all grew up in a Roman Catholic world. We were all taught Roman Catholic doctrine all of our lives, whether we called ourselves Catholic or Protestant or atheist, or Buddhist, or Hindu, or whatever, we were all taught Roman doctrine because we all grew up in a Roman world under Roman imperialism. So that's why we have to unlearn so much when we come to the scripture. So when we see this point number nine, we believe in the universal gathering. Okay, This is talking about ecumenism. Ecumenism is a satanic movement under the papacy of Rome in order to gather all religions together under the umbrella of Rome. Okay, so it, the, the, according to Rome, it doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant or an Islamist or whatever. Let's just all love one another, forget about doctrine, and just love God. Okay, that's of the devil. Because Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. See, so if I were to just put down my Bible, forget about what my Bible says, and join together with my with my Protestant friends or my Catholic friends, and just forget what forget about what the Bible says, and just be nice to everybody, is that loving them? No, it's setting a snare for their feet. It's setting it's laying a net for their feet. It's knowing that they're about to perish and not saying anything, which makes me an accomplice to their death. And is that loving God? No, it's not loving God. To love God is to keep his commandments. But to, to put his commandments aside so as not to offend anybody else and just be friends with sinners, that's not loving God. That's hating God. That's hating God. And that is the crux of this gathering at the National Mall on the south end of the world's largest pentagram right in front of the Washington Monument, which is a satanic obelisk, a phallic symbol of fallen angels 
right in front of the reflecting pool, as above, so below. And all these people that hate God, that don't want to read his word and do what he says, but they just want to go in on the broad path that leadeth unto destruction. They like, they like the broad path because it's much easier. They don't have to search the scriptures. They don't have to actually do what God says. There's going to be women dressed in men's clothes there. There might even be men dressed in women's clothes there. There may be sodomites there. There's going to be people from all different denominations there, and all different denominations are hell-bound. Because Jesus Christ doesn't have any denominations in his church, and if you belong to a denomination, you don't belong to Jesus Christ. Because no denomination belongs to Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Paul said in Ephesians, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. The whole family in heaven and in earth is named after the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we are called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have a building with, a, with that name written on the door. We don't have a denomination. We don't have a 501c3 tax shelter status with the government. We don't have a license from anybody because we don't need a license from anybody to serve God, to be ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, We can't marry anybody except our own wives because nobody can marry anybody except his own wife. You see, no man can marry anybody except his own wife. A pastor can't marry you to your wife. He can marry you and your wife to the state by tricking you into a contract with the state that you know nothing about. But no pastor can marry you to your wife. The only person who can marry you to your wife is you. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. It doesn't say, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and hire a pastor to marry him to his wife. The Bible doesn't say that. That's not what the law of marriage is. People have been very deceived. And so the universal gathering that he's talking about is a Catholic gathering. Universal means Catholic. Okay? So he says, We believe in the universal gathering, unity, and fellowship of all who have received salvation. When he's talking about receiving salvation, he's not talking about those who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and been saved from their sins. What he's talking about is the lie that he preaches that if you will accept Jesus Christ and say a sinner's prayer, then he will be your personal Lord and Savior, and you'll be washed from all your sins and have the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? That's a lie. And you haven't received salvation. You have received a deception. So he says, we believe in the universal, the Catholic gathering, unity, and fellowship of all who have received salvation. Now, I want to talk to you about the word unity for a second. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Praise the Lord. And let's look at verse 3 and verse 13. It says in verse 3, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Spirit with a capital S. This is referring to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Okay? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, and I could take more time and go through the context with you, but I'm not going to do that right now for sake of time. But I recommend that you do so. And verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of the faith. The faith. Okay, what's the faith? The faith is the doctrine that we believe as Christians. The faith of our Lord Jesus Christ is the doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it means that which the Bible teaches about who Jesus Christ is and how we come to be in him and he in us. That's the faith. Okay, How we live our lives as Christians. Everything that, that the Bible teaches us about who Jesus Christ is and how we are to be saved from our sins by his gospel and serve him until we die. That's the faith. And this verse 13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace till we all come in the unity of the faith. This is the only two times that the word unity is used in the New Testament. Did you know that? The word unity is only written two times in the New Testament. And it speaks of the unity of the Spirit and the unity of the faith. Okay? So with those that don't have the Spirit of Christ, there can be no unity. And with those that are not in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, there can be no unity. So we who are Christians cannot have unity with those that are not in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
period. End of story. So the unity that he's talking about is not the unity of Christians. It's not the unity of the Spirit, and it's not the unity of the faith of Christ. It's Catholic. Okay, it's ecumenical. It is a unity of people that reject the living God, that despise his word, that will not search the scriptures, and would rather just go to church and pay their religious entertainers to lie to them with theological nonsense that they learned in seminary. These are people that hate God. Okay? And, and I know that that's a strong thing to say, and you might say, well, Brother Clinton, how can you say that? Well, Jesus said, He that loveth me, pardon me, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Period. So if you have God's commandments and you keep them, then you're loving him. And if you don't keep God's commandments, if you don't even care to read God's commandments and do what he says, then you hate him. If you would rather go to church and be a Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Lutheran or a Catholic or a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness, then seek God and his word and obey what he says, then you hate him. You might not agree with that, but it's the truth, whether you agree with it or not. Haters of God, the Bible says in the New Testament, haters of God. Brother Paul wrote that to Brother Timothy. Haters of God. Haters of God are those people that pretend to be religious. They pretend that they have their own personal thing worked out with God, and yet they don't care at all about seeking him in his word, about fasting and praying, about mourning for their sins, about turning from their sins. All they want is to live in their sins and then pay a religious entertainer at church every Sunday to tell them that all is well between them and God. They're haters of God. The Bible calls them haters of God. This is the universal gathering. This is the broad path that leadeth unto destruction. Point number nine in this statement of faith, he says, we believe in the universal gathering, unity, and fellowship of all who have received salvation. Now, what is fellowship? Fellowship is when you're gathering together with your fellows. Okay, fellows is not a very common English word anymore. Most people don't use the word fellow unless they're speaking about the scripture. But when people are fellows, that means that they are two people or more with something in common. Something in common. They're going in the same direction. They have the same goals. They're of the same kindred. They're fellows. And so you can't have fellowship with someone unless you're fellows. So those of us who are Christians, we can't have fellowship with those that are not in Christ Jesus. Okay? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Praise the Lord. No, it must be 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh-huh. Verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What's a yoke? It's, it's a thing that connects two animals together to do work, and they have to be the same size in order to be able to, to do the work that they're doing if they're yoked together. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What fellowship, fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? If one is righteous and the other is unrighteous, then guess what? They're not fellows. So they can't have fellowship. There can be no fellowship unless we are fellows. Okay? So he says in, in, chap, in point number nine, we believe in the universal, the Catholic gathering, unity and fellowship of all who have received salvation. Okay, he's talking about all those who are on the broad path who have believed a false gospel and falsely believe that they're Christians. They've never searched the scriptures. They just went to church and believed their religious entertainers instead. So they've been deceived and they've received a false gospel which can't save them. So they're accursed of God, preaching a false gospel to other people. Because remember, Paul said, If we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. Okay, I stumbled on it in my word, so let me say it again. Paul wrote, But if we, referring to him and the other apostles, But if we, or an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Okay? So those who preach to people that if they say a sinner's prayer 
or a, or a salvation prayer and accept Jesus Christ into their hearts, that they're saved, that they've become Christians by doing that, those people are accursed of God. They're accursed of God. So he says, we believe in the universal, the Catholic gathering, unity, and fellowship of all who have received salvation, born of the Spirit and Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. They're not born of the Spirit. To be born of the Spirit means to have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when that happens, you will speak with other tongues and prophesy. These people are not born of the Spirit. They're not born of anything. They're born of the corruptible seed of this world, if anything. So he says, born of the Spirit and Messiah Jesus Yeshua and called to fulfill the Great Commission to spread the gospel to all peoples, Jew and Gentile, to all unreached peoples of the world. Okay, and I'm going to stop there. In point number 10, he, he, he said some things that were pretty much true, so I'm not going to even go there. But we've seen by the things that were written on this website, in points 2 through 9 at least, out of 1 through 10, that it's all lies. It's all lies. And that Jonathan Kahn, with all due respect to him as a person, he may be a really nice man. Uh, he may really think that he's serving God. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's just a deceiver like Billy Graham was and like the Pope is. I don't know. I'm not accusing him of that. But whatever the case, whether it's knowingly or unknowingly, he's deceived and he's deceiving other people. Because Jonathan Kahn is not in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this organized movement that is going to be happening on September 26th at the National Mall, right next to the, 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 the Washington Monument, which may be, I'm not sure, but it may be the world's largest obelisk. Okay, I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. I could be wrong. But it, in any case, it is a giant obelisk. And I went into it once when I was 18 years old. I had no idea what it was. And so I went into it and walked up to the top. So it's really big. But it's, uh, it's a huge obelisk right in, front, right in front of the reflecting pool. That's satanic, as above, so below. And it's right at the south end of the world's largest pentagram, the streets of Washington, the District of Columbia, which isn't America. It's a foreign country, has nothing to do with America. It's a satanic country, which belongs to the Vatican, which is the war arm of the Vatican, which controls the U.S. military, which was one of the world's most powerful militaries, to serve the Vatican, to serve the purposes of the globalist mafia, to overthrow countries, to kill, murder, and destroy in order to secure the agenda of the oil, drug, and counterfeiting cartels. This is what Washington, D.C. is. So all these people, Jonathan Kahn is organizing this event so that all these people who don't know God, who are pretending to be Christians and are, are actually worshiping a trinity of Babylonian deities, who have never heard or obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and are preaching a false gospel so they are accursed of God, all these people are going to be meeting together. They're going to be getting gathered together in, from, in bus loads and truck loads and train loads. At least that's the plan. At this specific geographical point on the planet, which is one of the largest satanic antennas filled with satanic activity on the planet in order to have what they call a revival, what they call a return Okay, but it's not called a return to Jesus Christ. It's not called a return to the Word of God. It's not called a return to the old paths. It's just called return, and I'm not really sure what he means by that, and I haven't spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. Maybe you know, and you can add something in the comment form below. But this event called the return is a satanic event whereby multitudes of people on the broad path that don't know God, they are accursed of God, they hate God, are going to be gathering together at a specific geographical location, which is one of the largest satanic antennas on the face of the earth. And that's where they're going to be having this event. And they don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't know who Jesus Christ is. And they don't even seem to know, at least the, the, the masses of them don't seem to know, that Washington, the District of Columbia, isn't even American. So that's what I have to say. That's my, that's my input on this thing called The Return. Okay, I want to let you all know about this in the name of Jesus Christ. Once again, I don't have anything personal against Jonathan Kahn or against any, th any person that would be gathered together uh, for that event. I have a great love for those people that are lost and deceived. And that's why I'm making this video, so that if you were among those people that are lost and deceived, or even if you're Jonathan Kahn watching this video, praise the Lord, welcome, I'm here for you, to serve you as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, to teach you about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. 
And Jonathan Kahn, you should know better because you're a Jew. And you should know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, not three. There is no triune God. No such thing exists. So if you'd like to learn more about these things, please write to me. You can email me. My email address is also right below in the information box, right under the other links. You can post a comment on the comment forum here, and I'll be happy to address it for you. I'm here to serve you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a playlist on this channel called Trinity vs. the Scripture. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there are presently 99 videos on that playlist. Because there are so many verses of the Scripture that people have been taught to misunderstand because they've been taught Babylonian mythology by Rome. And they've been taught to misunderstand the Scripture. But the Scripture is very plain. It means what it says. Just like we talked about John 1.1 1, 1 earlier. It means what it says. It doesn't mean what it doesn't say. Praise the Lord. And so there's lots of verses of the scripture that people have written to me and asked me about. You know, what about this verse, Brother Clinton? What about that verse? And so I've done a lot of videos on, on that teaching from different verses of the scripture and illustrating to people from the scripture and only the scripture, not from theology, because theology is witchcraft and sorcery. Theology is the purposeful manipulation of words to enable and support doctrines that aren't written in the scripture. That's what theology is. That's what it's for. That's not just an unfortunate byproduct of theology. That's what theology is for. Okay, So I don't use theology. I speak as the oracles of God. And I've shown you from the scriptures in all these videos exactly why there is no trinity and exactly what the scripture means when it says what it says by showing you from the rest of the Bible so that you can see what the scripture actually means instead of thinking what Rome told you that it must mean. Praise the Lord. So I am here for you in the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I didn't mean to be speaking for an hour and 11 minutes, but ooh, there was a lot to talk about here. So I thank God for those of you who are still with me at this point, uh, because that shows me that you truly love the Lord Jesus Christ. If you uh, are angry and you, you're a theologian and you disagree with what the word of God says, um, I totally respect your right to be angry at God or even to be angry at me. And even to deny the word of God, I totally respect your right to do that. But I want to let you know that the comment forum here is not going to be a place, a public forum for you to post your opinions about you know, your hatred for the word of God or your theological stance or your uh, uh, denominational doctrine or any of that. If you have questions, I'll be happy to, to help you. But you may not invade the comment forum here and preach doctrines that are contrary to the scripture. You may not use the comment forum here as a social network to try to engage in conversations with others who have commented here in order to cause confusion. And I'm not going to allow you to do that. Okay, This is a Christian ministry. So this video and the comment form below this video is for the edification of those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and desire to obey his word and enter into his kingdom. Having said that, I'm going to let you go. Um, peace to you all who, who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. This is Brother Clinton. I'm out for now. Praise the Lord. He is coming soon.